Good afternoon. Well, for you, it's good morning, Elmari. Yeah. So uh, it is uh, my pleasure to start the last session of our symposium. Uh, we left the best for the end, state of the art. Um, session was curated by Elmari Nitling. It's my pleasure to introduce Elmari. Uh, before I go to details of education, I must say it's the best thing which can happen to senior guys to see your trainees growing and getting much better than than yourself. And um, El Marie, you are top notch fellow, and and uh, and then we work as a colleagues. This was always pleasure to work with busy cases in OR ICU Echo. Elmari Nitling uh, obtained her uh, anesthesia training in South Africa, in Stellenbosch. Uh, she uh, did her fellowship in cardiac anesthesia, ICU, and TE uh, uh, with us at Toronto General Hospital. And subsequently, she also finished fellowship in critical care training. Um, two years ago, she moved to uh, Western Canada. She's working currently in Kelowna General Hospital, still uh, have the same type of practice which she had at Toronto General Hospital. And she curator and assembly excellent speakers. So we are looking forward to, to hear a couple of lectures, state of the art. Uh, at the end, all panelists will, uh, will join Q&A session. Elmarie, floor is yours. And so to see you. Thank you, Martin and, and Marcus. It's uh, really nice being here and joining you guys today. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. We've really enjoyed the Congress and uh, I miss you guys on a daily basis. I can tell you that. <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. McKenson. is the Alan J. Toyer Endowed Professor of Anesthesiology and Chair of the University of Washington Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine in Seattle. He also serves as the Director of Interventional Echocardiography at the UW Medicine Heart Institute. Dr. McKenzie is a practicing cardiothoracic anesthesiologist and a key member of the UW Structural Heart Valve Team. As an internationally recognized expert in perioperative and interventional echocardiography, he is intimately involved in multidisciplinary efforts that aim to advance minimally invasive transcatheter cardiovascular care. He has given numerous national and international lectures on the role of 2D and 3D TEE in interventional and structural heart disease and has published over 140 peer-reviewed journal articles and the author of 20 book chapters. As a fellow of the American Society of Echocardiography, Dr. McKenzie is also the chair of the AAC Industrial Relations Committee and the immediate past chair of COPE. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are really privileged to have you and we very much look forward to this lecture. Thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, come to you virtually. I wish I could be in Toronto. But uh, anyways, um, I have a lot planned. I may have to stop somewhere in terms of time. So I'll keep a close eye on it. Um, I do some uh, assessment of new developments on occasion, mostly from an imaging uh, quality point of view uh, with Philips. Uh, here are my objectives uh, that you probably have in the program as well. I'm gonna focus on the imaging acquisition software packages and how to get the best out of your 2D and 3D image. I also make some remarks about some of the um, automotive uh, quantitative tools that we have. Uh, I want to highlight first uh, this important paper, which is not a quick read. It's 74 or so pages, but it is unbiased of any interventional tool or device that we implant into the heart and really lends itself for both perioperative and interventional imagers because we're really screening patients for the structural heart valve team, uh, and they can go to either a surgical or an interventional approach. To start off, I thought it's important uh, now at the end uh, of the meeting to realize that we can always strive for a better image. Now, these are very good 3D images. They don't always come out as good, but we should always try intentionally to get the best out of our image acquisition. And I can say myself, there's always something I can do to improve my image in the first place. Here are 
four valves all on fuss, as you see. And if we turn this around, we have the ventricular views or the LVOT view on the left, and then the RVOT view for the pulmonic valve on the right-hand side. Again, we need to know how we're looking at 3D structures, because in the end, we just have a 2D plane screen that we look at. So rotation is key, and that will come back as a topic. Here's some pathologies for the aortic valve. In the center, you have a bicuspid aortic valve with a lot of calcium. And then on the right-hand side, aortic insufficiency. When you take it to the mitral valve pathology, there may be a rheumatic valve. We don't see as many here, but certainly other parts of the world, rheumatic mitral stenosis is quite prevalent. On the right-hand side, a typical uh, wide open mitral regurgitation in an A2 prolapse. For the tricuspid valve, we have now certainly in the interventional space imaged the tricuspid much more, and we've learned a ton in addition in how to best image it and how to use our 3D and 2D tools. I'll get to that uh, hopefully towards the end. Uh, for the pulmonic valve, it's hard to image it in 3D well. The one on the left has a very high frame rate. It's going quite slow, but you might discern all three cusps, all three leaflets on the right-hand side. The utility of biplane imaging for a color flow assessment of pulmonary insufficiency. Now we've come a long way. I still um, at times image in the paraoperative space, but I have my focus quite often uh, to be fully transparent uh, on the structural world with interventional echo as a cardiac anesthesiologist. But yeah, we have come a long way from uh, very uh, mechanical valves uh, to uh, open heart repairs. Now they're done robotic in places and uh, we certainly need to provide a lot of imaging ahead of time and then all the way to minimal invasive surgeries or even percutaneous approaches such as the mitral tear procedure. Now, along with that, the utilization of echocardiography uh, moving from paraoperative echo to interventional echo has really been growing uh, significantly, you could say exponentially. Now, again, it starts with a good image. If I have an image like this of a mitral valve that is a mechanical anti-anatomically orientated valve, and uh, I wouldn't have enough information, let's say one of the leaflets would be stuck, then I could turn things around. I happen to see the aortic valve, which, you know, was not in the, um, not in the focus initially, but now we actually see it quite well also. But if I take that same piece of information and I place it into a multi-planar assessment, I can very quickly uh, ascertain or convince myself that both leaflets are fully moving and that there should be good flow, even though I have not um, added color flow. Talking about color flow, uh, normal washing jets need to be recognized as well. And again, a multi-beat acquisition, which we can do in a patient who is in a sinus rhythm, will allow us to discern the washing jets and actually figure out that there's not just two, but actually up to three, as you see in this image, which I acquired with a GE device. And you see there's six uh, jets, three on each side. Um, they're there to wash off thrombus or prevent thrombus formation. Now back to that initial paper that I shared. And again, the QR code is on the right upper corner, but you can also freely get this off the American Society of Echocardiography's webpage when you look for guidelines. And uh, we, we went pretty systematic and I, I was mostly involved in the mitral uh, section of this paper. Essentially, mimicking here with my own images the Carpentier classification just to be as comprehensive as possible. And you see that 3D images now have made their way into guideline or standard recommendations. Talking about 3D, if we enhance a 3D image and we include um, the optimal imaging modality and view, viewpoint that even is with the TE probe now being in the stomach, I can actually get a transgastric long axis view like this and then turn it around and have a 3D image that gives me a lot of information about a bileaflet prolapse with uh, the contraction of the papillary muscle. And then to contrast that on the right hand side, you see a secondary MR case where now all the uh, cords are tethered. Um, all the strings seem to be still attached. There's no prolapse, but there's a lot of tension tethering and tenting of this mitral valve. There happens to be a 
a tab valve in place and then background for orientation the left atrial appendage. Now, if we take the 3D information to the next level, we can on the one hand side, on the left, um, use quantitative assessment tools that can be automated or can be relatively quick now, just a few mouse clicks, not as tedious as maybe 10 years ago when we had to use a, a software called QLab to go point by point and really do a lot of clicking and maneuvering until we would get a single end systolic image or quantification. On the right-hand side, there's a post-processing tool, which I'll come back to in a moment, but essentially it's a different way of displaying the same information. Uh, not sure it adds much to this functional um, case of a secondary MR, but uh, in some instances of paravalvular leaks or mitral regurgitation, for instance, this will actually add quite a bit. Back to this paper, again, uh, highlighting imaging tools, the biplane imaging, which comes as part of 3D, is really a key tool to quantify and locate, locate um, the mitral regurgitation as you see it here. So we move our biplane uh, tilt from right to left from the center of the valve through to A1, P1, and then on the left-hand side to P3. And we also use 3D tools uh, to basically calibrate our multi, uh, multi-modal views, including a bicommercial um, view for the mitral valve. Um, I'm not going to have much time to go into more quantification. Much of this quantification is in the process of being automated. But for instance, the important vena contractor area, which you see on the top level there, is not yet automated to my knowledge. Um, here I have brought to you, I noted that there are um, colleagues from Leipzig who have participated in this meeting, and I've been a faculty at this Leipzig TE master, and I took the liberty to bring about a couple of uh, examples of how I've used a multiplanar um, tool to assess a patient's mitral regurgitation. You see there's a clear P2 prolapse, but in order to bring out the maximum prolapse to then actually pursue this patient for a transcatheter tier edge-to-edge -edge repair, I actually used the 3D image that I acquired ahead of time to illustrate both to the interventional cardiologist as well as to the audience in this case, how to best use my, my cropping plane or my multi-planes, in this case, the red plane, which is the right upper, to bring out this prolapse. Now I can do even better if, if I take a 3D color image, and that's what you see here. So essentially on the left-hand side, you see how I'm using different tools. I'm optimizing the uh, zoom, and then I want to use a multiplanar tool. So I actually uh, go to a um, 3D tool, then I select multi-view, which is the uh, Phillips term for the multiplane. Uh, again, all machines now have similar tools, and then I lock these three planes. So now my red, green, and blue planes are all locked to each other. Now I'm actually going to stop this image for a moment so that I can find out the maximum uh, systolic MR in this prolapse. And there you have it. So now I can use my cropping planes and essentially put the multiplanes into the very center of that MR jet. You see it here in the short axis. You see it here in the right upper in the long axis and the left upper is going to be a commercial view. And now I can make my new changes with the red plane going through this jet to really bring out the runoff of the MR as well as the maximum PISA, which then actually means that I need to rotate as you see here with the trackball the plane for the red plane, the right upper, in order to optimally uh, do so. If I now hide the color, I've now really discerned the maximum prolapse, the maximum pathology. And for instance, if we do an edge to edge repair, that would lead to a slight clocked orientation of a tier device, be it an Edwards, Pascal, or a MitraClip device. I hope that uh, that illustration uh, makes a lot of sense. I think my new changes are important to really bring out the detail of pathology. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to go to uh, another example of using multiplanar assessment to bring out the pathology perfectly. Now, this first four chamber orientation here gives away that there's likely a P2 prolapse. But this patient was interesting enough presented with an outside TTE and outside hospital TEE. 
And there was a suggestion that P3 was involved in the prolapse. And I'm gonna show to you how I worked out that there was actually no issue in P3. Now, if you look at uh, the OnFast view, many of you who are quite versed um, will know that P2 is right here at the base of the posterior leaflet, but how far P2 reaches and how, how much P1 or uh, P3 or P1 actually are coming up above the annular plane, we don't know exactly from this 3D view. We also have a little bit of an issue with parallax. Now on the right-hand side, you see how I aligned the multiplanar uh, option in order to show uh, the prolapse quite well, again, in the right upper, which is the red plane. Now, if we go about and use biplane imaging, and this is how, how I think these outside uh, cardiologists may have gotten onto a P3 prolapse is if we, um, if we turn our multiplane appropriately into the commissures, we may actually discern that there's no prolapse in P1 and there may be no prolapse in P3 and A3. So again, this is a rotation we can do quite easily in a multiplanar assessment. However, if we use just biplane imaging as indicated in the guideline paper that I shared with you, we may come down in the center, we may see P2, we may see P2 also quite well here in the um, biplane color image. But if we now try to interrogate P1 and P3, so P1 is here, uh, we are interrogating right here. Uh, we see maybe at times there's something coming up, but overall looks pretty good. And we can ascertain that there's no uh, color flow going through P1. So we're good on that side. However, if we look at P3 still with the same multiplane angle, and this is important. So pay attention, we have 65 right now. I'm gonna interrogate the medial aspect, which should be P3. And what do I see? I do see a prolapse that could be, oh yeah, I'm in P3. So therefore this is a P3 prolapse. And do I see color come through? Yes, I do. So again, uh, the lack of rotation does not take into account that the mitral valve often has a bit of a smiley face orientation. So what we actually need to do is shown on this next one, where I have changed the multiplane angle for the bicommercial view off from the 65, which is the center to 35, now rotating. And with that, I can actually see that the leaflets are coming together and that there's no obvious posterior prolapse in this case. So again, uh, this uh, on the right hand side shows the optimal orientation with the commercial view now being at 35. On the left hand side, however, I'm still at 65 and you can easily see how the red line will still cut some of the P2 prolapse that, re that reaches quite immediately in this um, instance. I hope this is helpful. If we take a 3D model for that same valve, we might also shed some additional light on it. And again, appreciate that the prolapse is predominantly in P2. Now I'm gonna take this to another level and a different example. This is actually from last week. Um, I came a little late to the cath lab. My, one of my colleagues had already obtained a 3D image, which you see on the left-hand side. And I looked at that 3D image and in and of itself, it was quite confusing to be honest. So I didn't even spend time on it. I actually acquired my own images, not with a frame rate as high as my colleague did, but with a frame rate of a two beat uh, acquisition. The frame rate was still only eight because of the large area of interrogation. However, if I play this, uh, what did I do? I didn't only freeze the image in the maximum MR, but I also start to rotate and I'm using a tool where I have a little bit more transparency in terms of the um, uh, different planes that we're looking at in this 3D image. And if I rotate this uh, a little bit more, I can really see what's happening, meaning there is a P1 prolapse or maybe a, a, a lateral P2 prolapse that is involved in this particular regurgitation. Taking that to the next level, I can do more rotation, again, emphasizing how, how important it is to not just to quantify, but to also observe what we have for pathology. And I cannot do that if this image is moving quickly. I need to freeze and then rotate. 
that's very similar to a, a, a child, a very early childhood. We take a tool into our hands and we need to uh, hold it in order to really grasp the full extent of the shape and rotate it in front of our eyes. That's what babies do when they get to know a new tool. On the right hand side, it's a very different uh, color illustration. I've increased the transparency of this modality. So in this glass view, I'm looking through the, you know, the tissues and I can really see where the um, MR is forming and which direction it's going. Um, yet another case here, uh, just uh, from, from last week also, uh, this is a Hocum case uh, that we did a sesame procedure, which is um, essentially a percutaneous slicing of uh, the interventricular septum underneath the aortic valve to allow for more flow in a Hocum case. And I'm not showing the procedure, but I thought the pathology was remarkable, where you see even in that four-chamber view, the uh, septal touch of that anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet is trying to follow, not coming quite along. You have a typical mid to late systolic posteriorly directed MR jet. Uh, shown in a long axis view, I can convince you that the MR is mostly orientated posteriorly. Taking that to a multiplane assessment, I have everything in one view. And again, I show the posterior directed jet. I see the forward flow that's highly agitated through the aortic valve indicating, ho indicating hokum and LVOT obstruction. Now taking that 3D image, if I have a 3D uh, back to in a slicing tool, I can, uh, I can achieve a better understanding of where that septal contact is happening in the LVOT. Again, I've carefully sliced uh, through this LVOT and I see the anterior leaflet on top and I see the most of the impact and the obstruction comes about in this aspect of the lateral LVOT right here. Again, same information, same 3D image, it's, but it's allowing us to quantify and locate exactly what's going on. Uh, moving forward um, to the um, uh, functional MR cases, um, when we add a bigger 3D volume, again from transgastric, we can also understand the pathology much better. We see the tension on these cords, there's up to 120 cords. We can't see all of them, but if you image from transgastric, you have a good uh, inter interrogation with a perpendicular uh, scanning onto the cords and you get uh, pretty good information. As you see here in the short axis in 2D color compare, I have a lot of information about the orientation of the jet or the footprint of the jet. I don't even have to measure this out, but I do see it's a typical elliptical shaped MR jet. And then on the right hand side, even from here, I can get a good long axis and I see how the posterior leaflet is uh, quite tethered in this particular instance. Taking a comprehensive baseline TE exam with a functional case uh, to the next level, we can then also use what is called a speckle tracking uh, longitudinal strain. Unfortunately, these um, clips don't seem to be playing automatically but uh, I think you've all seen these types of examples. And uh, we've taken that piece of information to assess if patients that undergo induction of anesthesia as a simple intervention actually do suffer from a deterioration of their global long longitudinal strain as a marker of functional um, uh, ability uh, of the left ventricle. And we've also looked at an intervention such as mitral tear and didn't find, um, this is uh, an abstract only, uh, wasn't the full data set quite yet at the time. But again, interesting how to how you can use a tool such as speckle tracking um, longitudinal strain assessment uh, to really look into things that we do as anesthesiologists or that we do as interventional teams to a patient's heart and see how that affects it. Uh, the graph in the center essentially shows in the conclusion that we didn't have any evidence that there was a significant impact um, on either one of these interventions. Uh, back to the quantitative aspect, uh, just briefly wanted to show uh, you uh, this um, software, which is um, assessing essentially quantitatively, not only the diameters of a mitral valve annulus, but also the uh, 
the, the movement over time, as you see here in both of these graphs, and there's not much happening, meaning this mitral valve is already pretty much fixed. There's not a lot of dynamic movement. So if we take that information um, back to um, more quantified, quantitative approaches, we can actually, and this is a paper from a quite a few years ago, where we looked at mitral valve repair uh, versus uh, functional MR. And as you see on the right-hand side, annular displacement and annular distance, as you see in the center bars, is not that different between patients that actually have a mitral annuloplasty done to their primary MR, as opposed to those with functional MR in the first place which could be important in a patient where maybe there's MR in the setting of cabbage and your surgeon is asking, should I add an annuloplasty ring to this functional MR patient's mitral valve? And if you already pick up with this um, assessment tool that the annulus is more or less fixed, albeit dilated, then the question is how much are you adding in a particular uh, scenario like this? Um, we took the 3D quantification with the vena contractor a little bit more to the next level in the context of mitral clip um, interventions together with the Houston group, just to show the simple um, principle behind it. You take the 3D image with the color and you cut carefully, particularly in the uh, footprint, if you will, of the vena contractor area, and you can quickly discern that a 2D assessment would just be a long axis diameter of 0.5 centimeters, as opposed to a vena contractor area that seems to be quite large because again, it's elliptical. And if we look at uh, the study uh, without going into too much detail, we used this approach in 155 available full data sets. And we found that we have to be quite aggressive in our reduction of MR uh, based on the vena contractor area. Uh, to prevent these patients from coming back to the hospital or having um, having other interventions needed. Uh, lastly, uh, very quickly, wanted to touch on the tricuspid valve before I close, which means uh, we have here um, an overview of what's happening in the tricuspid space. Much before the mitral space, we now have transcatheter replacement uh, along with repair techniques, but certainly still have surgical uh, repairs as well. And I'm going to go very quickly on these images. Again, we need to be multimodal in our imaging, often using short axis and long axis views, as you see it here. But then importantly, again, utilizing a 3D image to ascertain exactly what's going on. And for instance, if we do a nice slice across the right ventricle, we might be able to identify a papillary muscle that is associated with the anterior leaflet right there, or maybe more of a posterior leaflet associated papillary muscle that comes into light right there. Again, uh, this is uh, additional information obtained from a 3D data set. You can also plan a tier procedure for the tricuspid valve. Let's say you wanted to go between the septal and anterior leaflet. You can orientate your red plane, and then you have a, a pretty good grasping plane right there. Um, finally, uh, uh, second to last slide, uh, functional TR. We've assessed based on multiple systolic frames that the bulk of um, TR is happening in the first third of systole. This was important work done together with um, Terry Sun, who now works in Vancouver, one of our many Canadian fellows that has come through our program. Uh, to conclude, I didn't uh, have enough time to go into all of the standardized and automated um, uh, quantification tools, but hopefully it gave you an overview uh, and remind you of the importance of getting the best possible image to then look into the pathology, pause and freeze and rotate. And then um, the imaging technology is continuously evolving. So it's good to, um, to push um, the cardiovascular specialists that come with the machines and help you uh, to find out what's new on these platforms or what's embedded in the software that is not automatically maybe shared with us. Uh, ultimately, you need to be able to not only interpret the TE image, but also clearly communicate the pathology to your surgeons or interventional cardiologists. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. I made some sourdough bread this morning and uh, added the maple leaf. I hope it came out okay. Uh, it certainly tasted pretty good. Thank you.